Hi everyone, in this video we are going to get an introduction to chapter 14 titled Statistics. The first section of chapter 14 we organize and visualize data, there will be lots of definitions, um, so I'll read through what I feel is important on each of the slides here. Um, you pause and however you've been taking notes, uh, either just read through the slide or write down what you choose to write down or if you have them printed, um, but you should read through each of the slides even if I don't verbatim read everything off to you. We start with a definition of what statistics is. Uh, most of you have been introduced to statistics in some way, shape, or form in earlier classes in high school, talking about mean, median, and mode. We go a little bit deeper uh, into statistics in this course, but not with this first section. This first section is pretty um, pretty introductory, uh, but we get a, a definition for population. Th that is all of the items under consideration, whether they're people, or, or objects, it's all it's the list of all of the items that you're uh, talking about. Uh, and then your sample is a subset of that population that you're considering. We describe a sample as biased if it does not accurately reflect the population as a whole with regard to the data that we are gathering. That's what it means to be a biased sample. Bias occurs in various ways. One is uh, called selection bias. Uh, it's really important to determine who's going to be in your sample in a very particular way. There's a lot of, of research into statistics into how to appropriately do that, especially when dealing with people. Um, but also, uh, there's question leading question bias, um, and that again in statistics, it's really important to write good questions, and that's something that people work hard to do. The information that we collect is called data. Data can be qualitative or quantitative. Qualitative means it's a characteristic, eye color, gender. Quantitative is a, a, a numerical measurement such as height and weight. Once we start collecting our data, we look at the frequency. Uh, the frequency is the number, how often that value occurs. Um, and that's the first way that we kind of organize data is in a frequency table, also known as a tally table. Then the relative frequency is the percent of the time that that item occurs. So you take the number of times that it occurs out of the total, and that's called the percent frequency distribution. We'll do a quick example here, um, and we're ta in this example we're talking about, we've got a sample of 25 viewers of the show NCIS, everybody's parents' favorite TV drama. Um, and they're rating this show as excellent, above average, average, below average, and poor. Here we get our 25 results from the 25 people in the sample. And to make our tally table, all right, I'm just going to scroll down here. You would literally just count, you know, how many A's and V's and B's, etc. Um, and so we'll title this evaluation. And then the next column is frequency. You have likely done this before, but now we know that it is officially called a, uh, d a frequency distribution table. Okay, uh, and then let's see. So we have E, we have A, V, B, and P is for poor. And then you would just go through and, you know, tally them up and count them and all that. And if you do that, you have four E's, four excellent episodes, seven A's, uh, I think it's eight V's, four B's and two of the shows were rated as poor, okay? So that's the first thing, a frequency table, um, relatively straightforward. We can add on a column for the relative frequency, relative frequency, and then you would just take four out of the total, which is 25, and that is decimal point one six, or you would take 7 out of 25, or 8 out of 25, or 4 out of 25, or 2 out of 25. And let's see, this is equal to 0.28, this guy is 0.32, this is also 0.16, and this will be 0 0.08. And if you add up all of those relative frequencies, you should get 100% or 1.00. Okay, so that's that's the first thing that we really do in this section after we get our definitions. We make a frequency and relative frequency table. 
In this next example, uh, we have 40 healthcare workers take, have taken an AIDS awareness test and they earned the following scores. Uh, sometimes when we have lots of data, it is helpful to organize our frequency table or our relative frequency table using what are called um, classes or groups. And this one I'm not going to uh, do by hand, but I will show you how you would organize this by groups on the next slide. Okay, so you, you because there are so many different scores, we have them grouped in ranges. Classes is also used. Um, we have the 50 to 54 range that has a frequency of 2. You can go back and look. We have the 55 to 59 range for the score that has a frequency of 3, etc., on down through the list. Um, and notice that with each of these uh, uh, ranges or intervals or classes, right, this ends at 54, the next class and starts at 55. It would be incorrect to go 50 to 55 and then start the next group at 55 because what if someone scored a 55, which, uh, which of the values, where would we include them? Or sometimes what you'll see also is 50 to 54.99. You might see that also okay we can also organize our data uh, once we have the distrib the frequency distribution we can organize our data as a bar graph okay using either the frequency or the relative frequency and in this visual example in this one we have our uh, NCIS ratings um, we have the frequency table over here and we've gone and organized that using a bar graph, okay? You've made bar graphs in the past, um, you'll make them again in this section. I highly recommend doing them by hand when you're doing the homework and picking the right answer as opposed to trying to just guess the right answer because when you get to the test on this content, um, you know, you don't really have the opportunity to guess and then try it again and try it again and try it again. So you really should try these by hand so that you can make sure that what you do matches um, what choice you are selecting. In this next bar graph, we have the relative frequencies that we've created a, a, uh, a bar graph of. And if you go back a few seconds in the video to the previous um, example, what you'll notice is that the relationships between the bars for the, the frequency bar graph and the relative frequency bar graph, they look the exact same. Okay, It's just the scale that has, that has changed, but the relationships between the bars, as long as you have a consistent and good scale, those remain the same. We get a couple more definitions on this next slide, the first being discrete and continuous. Right? The number of children in a family is an example of a discrete variable, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whereas weight is an example of a continuous variable. I can weigh any number of pounds because I can measure that as accurately as I want uh, you know, to whatever decimal point I choose. And then the next uh, definition is for a histogram. Okay, histogram looks kind of like a bar graph, but uh, we use a histogram to graph a frequency distribution when we're dealing with continuous variables. Okay, that's when we use a histogram. In this example, we will uh, create a histogram, and uh, we've got a professor banned use of social media, and then they charted the increase in test scores um, on st of in students in the class, right, to make this into a fancy schmancy histogram. I'm going to draw my vertical and horizontal axes and draw a nice little scale going across the bottom. It looks like I'm going from 0 up to 50, so I'm going to just go by 10s. This is 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 for my histogram like that. And then up the side, uh, my frequencies, it looks like I, my highest frequency is 23. So I'm going to just count by fives, 10, 15, 20, and 25. 25 up there, 20, 15, 10, and 5. Okay, this horizontal axis is the points gained. Points gained. And then going up the side is the frequency. And then we need a title here, increasing scores. something like that all right and then I'm gonna change color and draw my bars my 0 to 10 bar it has a height of 14 so it looks something like that maybe I should have made it a little bit higher maybe a little bit closer to 15 like that and then I would color it in all nice and scribbly like that okay my 10 to 20 interval 
has a height of 23. It's going to be about up there like that. And I'm not doing this on graph paper. I'm just sketching this by hand. So it might appear a little bit messy. My scales might not be exactly perfect, but hopefully you get the idea here. Um, when you select the right button in my math lab, uh, it's, it's just going to be a multiple choice question. But when you show me your work, especially when you submit the test or when you show me your work on an activity, right, that's when it's going to be very important to, to have this work done by hand and, or to be able to do this work by hand. Okay, this next bar has a height of 17. And this is the type, you know, the way that I would want to see it when you do submit it by hand also. Okay, or when you do submit your work. Um, I just, just sketching it out on, on paper is perfectly fine. If you have graph paper lying around, go for it. Um, but I won't require that. And then the last bar has a height of 3. Imagine your score going up by 50 points, 40 to 50 points. One of those three students did. All right, so that's how you make a histogram, okay? On this next slide, we have a histogram for the relative frequency, the percents, all right? Um, and, you know, you make it in the exact same way. You just compute the percents for each one and then uh, create your histogram. This next example has us looking at a histogram and answering a few questions based on that histogram, okay? And this one is the, the number of um, Atlantic hurricanes over a period of years. Answer the questions on the slides that follows. So what we're looking at is the, the horizontal axis is the number of hurricanes per year. The vertical axis is the frequency, okay? So what that means is like this, let me label a bar. I'll, point at one, this bar right here. So what does that bar represent? That means that there were six hurricanes per year. Well, I shouldn't have one that's six and six. Let me switch to a different one. <laughs> All right, let's point at this one right here. There we go. That bar right there. What does that represent? That means that there were 10 hurricanes per year, and that happened six times times. So there were six different years where we measured 10 different hurricanes. 10 hurricanes, six years. Okay, so that's how we need to read this graph. And let's look at our first question. Uh, what was the smallest number of hurricanes in a year during this period? Smallest number of hurricanes per uh, in a year. All right, so the smallest number is over here. And is it the one or is it the four? It's the four. The four represents the number of hurricanes. So the smallest number of hurricanes, that would be four. Okay, that only happened once. What was the largest? The largest was over here at 19. 19 hurricanes in one year is the largest. Even though it only has a frequency of one, it only happened one time, but 19 hurricanes in that year. Part B, what number of hurricanes per year occurred most frequently? Now I'm looking at the highest frequency. What number of hurricanes occurred most frequently? That would be 10 times, but the 11 is the answer to this question. 11 hurricanes occurred most often. So we're most likely to see 11 hurricanes in a given year. And then uh, part C, how many years were the hurricanes counted? Well, for that, I would need to total all of the frequencies. That's one plus one plus six plus six plus nine, etc., 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 all the way up through, adding all the frequencies. That's how many years we counted these hurricanes, and you should get 58 if you count that up. Finally, part D, don't want to scroll up too much. In what percentage of the years were there more than 10 hurricanes? To answer part D, I need to find, let's see, 10 hurricanes. So I'm not looking for 10 on my frequency. Here's 11 hurricanes, 12 hurricanes, 13 hurricanes, 14 hurricanes, 18 and 19 hurricanes. Okay, but I'm not adding up those numbers. It asks what percentage of the years. So I'm adding this 10 plus this 5 and this 5 plus, let's see, I think that's a 3 and a 1 and a 1. If you add them up, you should get 25. And then it says in what percentage out of 58 equals uh, 0.43. Feel free to check that in your calculator, which is 43%.
All right, so that's how we uh, use our histogram to answer some questions. So it's important because we are looking at two different numbers to think about what each axis represents. The horizontal, the number of hurricanes, the vertical is the frequency. The final topic of this section is a stem and leaf display, and it's helpful for comparing two sets of data side by side for analysis. In the example that we will look at, the following um, are the number of home runs hit by the home run champions in the National League for the years 1975 to 89, and then we're comparing that to 2001 to 2015 using a stem and leaf display. Okay, so for these, the stem is the tens digits in this problem, or in this data set, and the leaves are the ones digit in each of these uh, home runs. And I've kind of skipped to the what the stem and leaf display should look like. Okay, so if a if a person has 38 home runs, that's represented with a stem of three, and the leaf of eight is over there. Okay, so this four and this seven represents the the home run hitter that had 47 home runs this five and two is 52 home runs okay so we we group all of the the stems the th the 30 stems together the 40 stems together the 50 stems together and then organize the leaves to the right of that put a vertical line here organize the leaves to the right of that in uh, ascending increasing order okay so you would create the the plots for each of those two sets of years and then the final step is to place the stems in the center and then the leaves going out to the right for one of the data sets and the leaves going out to the left for the other data set. And it allows us to compare those two sets of years and see how home run hitting has changed in Major League Baseball, okay? That takes us, that is the end of the section. That's the last topic. Um, please work on the homework. Let me know if you run into any problems. Um, thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day.